In the military, when you're given a mission, you have to accomplish the mission. That has been the most helpful thing because real estate investing and entrepreneurship is very challenging. You encounter so many challenges, so many hardships, and I think it's really easy to get demoralized and give up, but I never thought, oh, I can just give up. Welcome back to the Investor Podcast. I am your co-host, Andra Sigdeli. In today's episode, we have Mara McGraw. She is a Marine veteran who leveraged military skills to become a successful real estate investor. She has flipped over a hundred properties. So stay tuned and learn those strategies to grow your portfolio as well. So Mara, how being a Marine has helped you with the challenges of investing in real estate? Great question. So I was a Marine logistics officer for 10 years, and it's helped me in so many ways. I think the biggest way is that it gave me the mindset that there is no giving up because in the military, when you're given a mission, you have to accomplish the mission. There's no giving up or I don't feel like it, you have to find a way to accomplish the mission. So that has been the most helpful thing because as many of your listeners know, real estate investing and entrepreneurship is very challenging. You encounter so many challenges, so many hardships, and I think it's really easy to get demoralized and give up. But for me, after 10 years of that was never an option. So I never encountered a challenge and was like, oh, I'm going to give up. Like, maybe this isn't for me. Of course, I had doubts and everything, but I never thought, oh, I can just give up. I always thought I have to find another way. I have to push through this. So I think that has been the biggest thing that has helped me in business. There have been lots of other things. Of course, I learned to manage lots of people from all different walks of life. Oh, I, lo I love that. I want to break it down. I want to yes. break it down for everybody that are listening here. Let's break down those like military strategies, right? You talk about the mindset and I love that because in real estate, people, I, I always say it's a roller coaster, right? People are so excited at the beginning and they read the book and they went to this workshop and they, and then they get their their offer denied or they lose that property. And then once they get the offer accepted, they get excited all over again until the appraiser can't comes back low. And then they appeal the appraiser and they get to closing. And then there's a delay there. So it's just like, and then you finally close and it's good to go. And then you enter in a different roller coaster with tenants and, and, and rehabs and different things. So it's it's all good. But let's let's break it down the military strategies in different parts. So in terms of leadership, cuz a lot of people that I come across, they know how to flip a house, they know how to rent it, but they did not develop the leadership skills that takes to be a successful investor because in any strategy that all of you are listening doesn't really matter. You're dealing with people right? So sometimes they forget that they also need to develop the leadership skills. So let's talk about that part specifically. What military strategy in terms of leadership are transferable to real estate investing? Well, yes. In the military, I learned in the gauntlet how to lead people from all different walks of life, um, all different backgrounds. And that has been so helpful. I think some of the tenets of military leadership are um, accountability is a huge one and personal accountability is probably the biggest. So when something is going wrong in the military and you're the leader, it's ingrained in you that the first question you have to ask is, how did I fail my Marines or how did I not prepare them properly? I think that is very helpful. I think you know, in our culture today, that's not necessarily taught. There's a lot of like, you know, blame shifting and um, kind of a lot of tendency towards victimhood. But in the military, that's not the case. If something goes wrong, the first person they look at is the leader. Um, and you have to ask yourself constantly, like, what could I have done better? How can I better prepare and lead my Marines? So I think that 
It starts with personal accountability and then training. There's a huge emphasis on training. You can't just expect people to step into a role and succeed right off the bat. I mean, every now and again, you'll get a superstar that that does happen, but it's very rare. And you know, as a military leader, that it's your responsibility to train people, to set expectations, to hold them accountable, to counsel them constantly, and always push them to keep moving up in terms of their ability. So I think those are a few things that have transferred and really helped me. I couldn't agree more. I think the challenge here is that um, our egos, right? We're fighting against our egos. And when something goes wrong, the easiest path is to blame the other person, the other person in the inability, I can barely speak, inability to see what you saw, to think as you thought. So it's just an alignment on expectations. I want to understand how oneself can become aware that their ego is getting on on the way. Because in the military, based on what I'm hearing, is the default. It goes to the leader immediately, and the leader has this self-awareness. But a lot of investors might not have that at all and might be in a blaming game. So how do we bridge that gap if we are them? (laughs) So I guess one practical recommendation is I would highly recommend Jocko Willink's book, Extreme Ownership. Um, It's so good. And he does a way better job than I'm saying right now of, of teaching how the military teaches this principle and how you can apply it to business. It's such a fantastic book. Um, But I think it comes down to as simple as when something goes wrong to take a pause and ask yourself, okay, why is this going wrong? What could I have done better? Because none of us are perfect. Even when things going right, you can usually look back and say, how, how could I have done this better? And if you just practice that and make it your default, it'll start to become habit. And I think another thing is being open to negative feedback. If someone is giving you negative feedback or criticism, you know, a lot of our first reaction is to be defensive. Like it's, you know, our protective instinct. But if you can try to look at critical feedback as actually a gift and someone telling you what you can do to get better, I think that can be a really good tool for improvement because we're always, I think most of us, we want to succeed as entrepreneurs and real estate investors, we want to get better. And so if we can just shut off the ego and our defenses a little bit and try to listen and learn and realize that none of us are perfect, I think that's those are two little things that people could implement. A hundred percent. And I think that with my own experience, right, when you're hearing negative feedback, it's always sour. And and if my cup is full if I am conscious, aware that this is not about me, I will respond differently if I versus if I am stressed out in a rush and then just going with 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 the flow. And I think a lot of people might think that when accepting that ownership, a hundred percent ownership, full ownership, that that will show weakness. And I I come I think it's completely opposite. I think your team is going to be looking at you in a much higher standard, a much more confident person that leader is self-aware of shortcomings and is willing to improve, is willing to listen. Because the opposite of that is when your team stops talking and stops bringing the negatives and the positives because why why bring it cuz they already expect the same answer from from you so if your team it's not bringing any negative feedback for all of you that are listening that's also a red flag in terms of are you encouraging them to bring that are you making it a safe 
place for them to do that. One way to do that, Liz and I always start with the meetings where we ask three things. What should we start? What should we stop? And should, what should we continue? So those three, those three things give all your team ability to come up with what is not working. Cause listen, in all, all our companies, right? Even if you're super successful, there are things that are not working that we're like, oh gosh, for God's sake. Right. But the, the, the point is that you you want that feedback. You almost crave that feedback. If everything is really good in relationships, in partnerships, in your team, somebody's not telling the truth <laughs> about what's really go, going on. Yeah. Another thing that we're both kind of getting at is humility is so important to being a good leader. In my opinion, it's the most important characteristic to being a good leader. and. Another thing that has helped me and that people can try is just when you mess up as a leader, just owning that and being honest and open with your team be like, I screwed up. They honestly usually appreciate that so much. And it sets the tone for people to, to, to do the same, to say, I screwed up. I'm going to improve this. It takes humility, especially at first, but I think if you do it, it can really help your organization grow. In terms of discipline, right? Military equals discipline. And like some some people might see it as like either is black or white, zero or 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 one. I want I want to expand the perspective a little bit. In terms of discipline in managing different businesses and growing and scaling your portfolio, how that ability to show up, that's how I interpret discipline, your commitment and ability to show up despite your thoughts, how you're feeling or anything. That's how I interpret discipline. But I, I want to bring that up to how discipline has helped you grow your portfolio. Great question. Discipline, it does help with everything. Um, I think in the military, you're taught to kind of develop systems. We have a saying that you'll, you'll never rise to the level of it, your expectations. You'll sink to the level of your training. Um, and in business, you can say something similar. You know, you'll, you'll sink to the level of your systems. Um, so yes, no, not every day is sunshine and rainbows. No one, I mean, myself included, like I don't wake up every day excited to get after it. Although actually, I mean, I do love my job. So it's most days are good, but I just have a really simple system that I use and I just try my best no matter how I feel every day to, to do this. And it's just, I write down the five most important things that I have to do that day and then I do them. And that's literally my not complex system to every day trying to make a little progress towards the ultimate goal. Is that is that how the, the, the I, I never been in military, love to, but never been. But is that how, how military strategy works? It, because in order, I, I'm assuming, right, it can't be so complex. It can it needs to be clear enough and um simple enough to be executed with high level. Is that how you created this very simple way for you to run your day? I think simplicity is beautiful and that's it is definitely you know, keep things simple, not try to get too humble. It is def definitely important. Um in terms of so military strategy. I would say that a huge emphasis is put on planning and preparation and um, success comes from the planning phase. There's another very common saying, they say that no plan survives first contact. So you may have this beautiful strategic plan that you've worked so long on. Everyone's been briefed. They know their role. But when you get into a battle or whatever the case may be, usually very quickly, the plan will fall apart because things are not going to go exactly how you anticipated or planned. But because you did so much preparation and study of the enemy, you are able as the leader to quickly adapt 
or flex your plan. Um, so I think that also translates to real estate because like you were saying at the beginning, every deal there's, it's very rare that a deal goes perfectly smoothly and you could have done the most beautiful analysis, the most beautiful spreadsheet and pro forma, but as you're going through due diligence, the closing process, whatever things are going to come up. But as you build your knowledge and you do the preparation, when you get to those moments where you're like, oh shit, like this is not going the way I thought you over time, especially will be able to pivot and figure out, okay, here's, you know, we got to change strategy or we have to make an adjustment here, or maybe the deal's not viable. You start to be able to make quickly make those important decisions because you've done so much preparation analysis, probably study of your craft, just like in the military, how we study um, past military leaders and our enemy and same thing, like people listening to this podcast are learning and listening and reading books. All that will come into play at certain moments in your career. I think that's a very, it's, it's, it's a shift of framing because a lot of people, I like what you're saying in terms of your first plan probably is not going to work, but you, because you prepare so much, you're going to gain the skills that you need in order to pivot. And I think that that is such a great expectation to have when you are investing in real estate, because a lot of investors feel that they failed, that they should have known that X, Y, and Z could have happened. And they feel that the plan that they put together, that they spend so much time building it, failed. And I, I like what you're saying because it's just part of the strategy. You will fail probably because that's life. And, and that is just how it's supposed to be. I think that the plan itself is not supposed to be your recipe. It is just a guide mm -hmm. for the next step. Exactly. It takes the pressure off of you as yeah. like, yeah, I have to succeed on this plan or or the otherwise I, I'm failing. Yeah, that's exactly right. And as you go along, you learn, you start to kind of know contingency plans. You're like, okay, this is what we're trying to do, but we have maybe backup plan and options B and C. So yeah, I think it's rare. I've even probably at, like you've done so many deals. I've Definitely, I flipped over a hundred houses now. Um, it's very rare that a project goes totally <laughs> according to plan. I don't know, maybe one or two out of a hundred maybe went smoothly. And it's to funny, plan. right? I remember building three new construction next to each other. Same, same thing, same thing. Just a couple of things were different in terms of finishes, right? But the three of them had different issues. The three of them, for some reason, <laughs> had different issues, right? Because yeah. they were in different positions. The one in the middle had different matters that we had to deal with. And I think that is just the right expectation. So for all of you that are listening, it really doesn't matter if you're getting started or if you're really experienced like like Mara, over a hundred flips. She has seen so many things. And on her next flip, she might see something new for sure. This just setting the expectations. And that's why we're having those real conversations. So you don't feel that you cannot make a mistake. You will. It's inevitable and it's part of your experience. And when you are building a portfolio, I want to get into risk management, right? You you talk about contingencies and things like that. You also need to plug in if shit hits the fan. If I need to pivot here, what are my plan B, C, and D? I like three plans to, to have it. So in military, how how do you utilize the contingencies as an exit versus Wow, I'm spending so much time in uh, focusing on what can go wrong versus on what can go right here. So how do you balance that, that out? Thinking back in the military, it was knowing what options we had available. So a really common 
thing that happens in a military operation is the weather can have a huge impact on your operation. So ideally, whenever you're cu- conducting like a ground forces operation, you will plan for some type of close air support, meaning like, you know, some type of aircraft that has uh, certain ammunition payloads will be there to support you if you get into contact with the enemy. But if something just slightly goes wrong with the weather, the, you know, the aircraft can't go up. And so you all, all of a sudden you don't have that. So you just have to know as a military leader, like, okay, if this happens, what are my other options? Do I have artillery? Do I have uh, another like adjacent unit? What are some other options that I can rely on to cover this gap that I now have in my plan. That's just one very common example that we had. So, and then in real estate investing, <laughs> the same thing. So you will have your plan, but it's good to to at least know your other options. So I'll give an example that I'm looking at right now. For example, I'm looking at potentially flipping a beach house in Gulf Shores, Alabama, close to where I live. And the simplest, cleanest way to do this deal is to flip it. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with the market right now. It is a beach house. So this is probably someone's second house. So a lot could go wrong. So I have to know, okay, I have the option to turn it into a short-term rental. So even if we flip it and something happens with the market, we can't sell for what we need to sell, we could just pivot to another option and turn it into a short-term rental. That's just the example that came to mind. I I also think that some some people think about cash flow in terms of their own property only versus the cash flow of the business. So I, I always want to be very conservative. Doesn't really matter the exit is strategy. What do I mean by that? Let's just use an example about like a burr, right? A single family house, a burr. I want to have cash flow for the process, the entire process, of course, for the business. So I can pay my private money lender play or pay the bank, make sure that I have uh, beyond enough funds to go through the entire process. But then after that, I think people just plan like I'm going to find a tenant in 15 days and then in 30 days I am renting out and then I'm going to go you know, super quickly. How about if you don't find it? How about if it takes three months? How about if it takes six months? Like run the numbers and and have that reserve if things don't go well. Same thing with Airbnb, right? Let's play three scenarios. What is the worst case scenario? What is the good case scenario? And what is the best case scenario that -hmm. you're like, wow, sold out before I even put on Airbnb. Worst case scenario, it took six months for you to vamp it up. So yeah. really playing those three scenarios will allow all of you that are listening to feel really confident about your decision. And that's what real estate is all about, right? Okay, if it goes this way, if it is sunshine, here's what we're going to do. If we have a cloudy weather, this is what we're going to do. If we have a thunderstorm, this is what we're going to do. I don't see that as ob- obstacles for holding us back. Completely opposite. When you did your due diligence and you plan ahead all those options, it's just part of the process. You are doing what you're supposed to do to mitigate your risk and feel super confident about it. So in terms of operations, right? So the experience that you you got by really managing a large portfolio. What the military strategies allow you to implement when managing a large portfolio? Oh, so many lessons. Um, We learned a few different things at different points. At first, of course, we were very growth minded and we grew from probably zero to 150 pretty quickly. Um, And it was just like, we didn't know what we were doing holding on for dear life. Um, and then at one, you know, at one fifty, it was like, okay, this cobbled together team, we have to pause and implement some systems here 
to survive to get to the next level. So we had to take a pause around 150 and hire some more people, implement some new systems, and then we were ready to grow. Then there was another jump from 150 to 300. And then again, at 300, all of our systems broke. Like, you know, everybody was stressed out. Like we couldn't, you know, maintain the maintenance on our property. So again, we had to literally stop. I don't think we took any new clients for three or six months and we had to revamp all the systems, (laughs) hire more people. And then another huge jump from three to 600. And at that point we took on some large apartment complexes. And from that experience, we, I would say overall, we grew too quickly. People told me this at the beginning, like, you know, beware of growing too quickly. You don't, that's something that I didn't really believe until I experienced it. But Um, Of course, those people were right. And we had to learn that like not every client and every property is a good fit for us. Um, We, you know, took on these big apartment complexes that turned out to not be a good decision. So then we actually scaled back from 600 to 450. And from there had to be a lot more discerning about the type of properties we would take, the type of owner clients we accepted. There were so many lessons from that experience, but those are a few that stand out. Awesome. And um, for all the the people that are listening, uh, where they can find more information about you? Well, you can follow me on social media if you want. You can find me at Maura McGraw on most platforms. And my real estate investment company is called Doratus Properties. So would love for you to follow us. And I have a podcast myself called Mastering Real Estate. So check it out, give it a listen. And yeah, I would love to be in touch with you. Awesome. All this information you guys can find on our show notes. Mara, thank you so much for spending time here with us. Thank you so much for having me.